I'm excited to, again to be able to preach to you and, and share with what is on my heart that God has given me this week. And uh, and I pray that our time together this morning is just a small snippet of the, the entire uh, different facets of our lives, the moments of our lives, as we uh, carry everything that we do in our, in our daily walk, um, being directed towards heaven. And the fact that we get to do it together here is something that um, I just take great joy in as a pastor. As a pastor, I love being able to see people enter into worship, enter into a time of engaging God together, and, and in the hope that we find rest. A lot of us need rest, the rest that only God can provide. And I think it's really key that we know that, that there is so much in heaven that wants to be extended to us through Christ that gives us rest. And speaking of rest and all that, I have to tell you that this has been a week that I've had um, in my nocturnal rest. I've had a lot of odd little dreams. And I don't usually dream. When I go to sleep, I'm usually just out and I wake up and it's great. I don't have to think about anything and the reset button kind of gets hit. And, um, but I had a lot of odd little dreams, like buds that I haven't seen in a long time. They're like, what's up? You're my dream. I don't know why. You know, um, Concerts to bands that don't exist, but I'm like their number one fan. You know, and Just weird things like that. And, uh, and in my household, when it comes to dreams, um, a lot of conversations in the morning start with, want to know what I dreamed about? And that's because I have four little kids in the house, and so I get to hear stories about when they flew, or when they had their best, you know, dessert, or going to Disneyland, or, you know, just random things like that, as well as sometimes nightmares, and things that um, kind of pop in, and, and, and it's just interesting that... Um, in years past, there's just been dreams that have kind of stayed with me, and and I don't know why. And I think it's really key that we can't count out that God can use dreams to help bring about His plan in our life. And when I say dreams, I'm not just talking about the ones that we sleep, but the dreams that God has given us when we're before Him, and we're seeking to understand and know about Him and about our lives. I recall uh, one Christmas Eve some years back when I was in a very desert or famine-like space in my life. And it was a time where I was in front of a fireplace and it was Christmas Eve and I was about to go into all the family festivities and all the overeating and you know, all that stuff. And, uh, and I was just asking God to give me a vision for my life as I was risking, for the first time in a long time, being really vulnerable to God, really open to God. And this was, at a, like I said, a very disruptive season in my life where there was a lot of uh, loss and distress that I had gone through. And I was thinking about the next year, hoping that it would be different than the one I had just gone through. And it was in front of that fireplace, alone, quiet, vulnerable before God in prayer, that I distinctly encountered the Holy Spirit ministering to me and revealing to me a, a reality about what He destined and created me to be. I couldn't deny any further that God had given me a heart and a desire to minister to others. And at that time, it was a, a very odd reality because it was very affirming and liberating and exciting to to think about God just speaking into my heart and in my life and giving me a direction and a dream and a vision for, for me. But what this meant was that I was going to have to declare this dream of my life before others. And that I knew when I started to do that, that I was going to meet opposition. Because here's the thing. When you start to declare the plans that God has for your life, you're going to start to come in opposition because the world naturally opposes God. And so when you start to live into that direction, you know you're going to come into conflict. You're going to come into people who hate or are jealous or are bitter who want to not act or completely be against the who are in rebellion with God. And so it wasn't so much that I was choosing a, a particular vocation or direction in my life. It was because I was deciding that I was going to start declaring what God wanted, not what I wanted. And that was a big step. And I knew that it was going to be disruptive. I knew that I had to declare the plans that God had for me. And I had to trust that God was the one that gave me that vision for my life. 
And I'm excited because we're starting a new series today called Overcome. And it's a series that I'm confident that I need to preach among us as a body of believers, as a community of faith. Because I know there are people living their lives in a world that has a lot of opposition for them. Especially when they're seeking to follow God. When they're seeking to continue to live into what they feel like God is drawing them into. And I think sometimes when that happens, when we start to follow God, things take place and they make us go into a defensive or, or a cautionary stance. And what I mean by that, there are moments in our life when that causes us to slow down or stop or proceed with caution, especially when we need to assess and make sure that we're not going to stop following after what God gave us or God showed us or God's calling us to. In these moments when we need to kind of readjust or when loss takes place or when there's conflict or when there's a season of spiritual drought or, di or delusion or relational rockiness. And there are moments in life when we're able to just kind of cruise on through and, and we're able to go from one place to another and we don't really see the areas that we need to kind of be aware of and take into stock or take into account. And what this all spells out to me is that in the life of a follower of Jesus, not just an observer of Jesus, when we find ourselves needing to follow Him, we are going to have to learn how to overcome. And I understand that I am in good company if I am amongst overcomers. Right, is there anyone here that had to ever overcome anything in their life? Okay, good. Then I'm in good company. Okay? And I thought that I thought so I wasn't alone. Because God was really clear to me about that, that evening about doing this series when I thought of it that we had to talk about overcome. And especially as I, each week I get to meet, I get to pray, and I get to be invited, which is a privilege, into your lives and to hear the narratives or the stories that God is working out. There is a lot of overcoming taking place, and I celebrate that. I am so thankful to hear that, how people are inviting God into their lives and they continue to overcome the opposition. Whether it comes from within or it comes from other sources or other people in the world, I want to encourage you to overcome. Because there's so much that God has for you. And when I when we started putting out the word like this, some people said, where are the vowels? What do you mean? Well, the vowels in the middle. They're missing. Right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm glad you caught that. You see, we have them at the beginning and we have them at the end, but we lost them in the middle. And the reason why we wrote it this way is because we want it to be characteristic of, of this series. You see, in the life of an overcomer in Christ, we start off right when we meet God. And we have that hope. And like this word, we start off right. And if we follow Christ and we bear witness in our trials, we trust and we know that we'll finish life just as well. However, even though there's trials or loss or challenges or confusion in life that cause us to bear self-sacrifice and we may miss a vow or two, like this word, we can still read when we stand back that it is spells to spell out overcome. Just like when we have started our life with Christ and we finish it in His presence in heaven, people are going to be able to see and the Lord is going to be able to acknowledge that the gospel is in our life. Even though there has been moments where we tripped up, even though there's been moments where we didn't understand, God is going to hold us together by His love as we started our journey with Him, and we trust that He's going to be there with us when we take our last breath here and our first breath in His presence. And there may be an O or an E missing in our witness, in our testimony. That doesn't spell out a perfect picture, but what I understand about the church, that the church is not a place for perfect people. Christ is the only one who is perfect. God is the only one who is holy. And this is a place devoted for people declaring the truth about that. Amidst, amongst the lives that we're living together. And that's what this series is about. I want us to be a church we're here where we can overcome because of the love of God and His story that's being realized out in our lives. And what I love that we get to do is that we get to do this by being introduced and led to the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Joseph has an amazing story for us about overcoming, 
talk about a guy who went through a lot. And all of it was for the purpose that actually benefits us. And so, and how this story begins is that God is the one who actually gives Joseph a dream. And the dream is the very tool or the very thing that causes the conflict and carries him through to carry out the plans of God in his life. And we're going to meet Joseph when he knows he has to declare this dream before his family. And it's really the catalyst that sets up the purpose of his life. So before we dive into the word, I want to set up where we're coming into scripture here because it's really important that we have a context or understanding of what we're reading. Here we find Jacob, the son of Isaac, old in age, and he has had already ten sons. And these ten sons are adults, and they're living out their birthright, they're taking care of the estate. And Jacob, or Israel, as God renamed him, um, has had two younger sons, Benjamin and Joseph. And Joseph really doesn't have much to do other than dream and be a dreamer. And for whatever reason, Israel or Jacob has found favor most in Joseph, even though he's not the first son, the one that retained a birthright. And so Joseph, uh, Jacob demonstrates this by giving Joseph an a ornate cloak or, an, or a technicolor robe as we know it. And this really shows that the rest of the family that he's dad's favorite. And this causes hate, this causes bitterness, this causes a lot of problems. And so <clears throat> what we find here is that things are already kind of tense. And then God gives Joseph a dream. So we're going to step into Genesis chapter 37, verse 3 through 11. It says this, Now Israel, who is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and made him an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. He could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, but suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to him. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of this, his dream and what he had not said. Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers, Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to him. And when he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you have? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now really, that last verse, Israel keeping the matter in mind is actually parallel to when we read about Mary after she was visited by the Holy Spirit or an angel that she was going to conceive Christ and she pondered the matter in her heart. And I think it's important for us to, to read as the reader to understand what Scripture is trying to say is that this is a significant moment. That Israel, keeping the matter in mind about this dream means that the dream is significant. And oh, the presence of this dream. Because here we have a hint of what God's plan is not only for Joseph, his family, and the nation of Israel. Could you imagine if you're one of Joseph's brothers? And hey, guess what? You're going to bow down to me one day. Guess what? Mom and Dad, you too. And that's the sun and the moon and the 11 stars. Now, I have to tell you, I have a younger brother. He's nine years younger than me. And I remember when he was uh, not, uh, he was young, but he was too old to, he, he knew better. And basically, we were talking about Mom and Dad and, and relationships and family and stuff like that <laughs> and uh, and what he started off the conversation was you know I don't know why I'm mom and dad's favorite but I, I don't remember the rest after that because I just, I'm out I'm done I'll talk to you later <laughs> but it's what we see here in the presence of the dream is that the dream actually disrupts the natural order of a family the pecking order. He's, the, he's one of the youngest. 
He's not to receive such a, a large task or a large opportunity. But God is challenging this, this plan. And think of Joseph. He must have been really excited, right? But guess what, you guys? I'm going to rule you all. <laughs> I'm going to get the best job. I'm going to get my hair back. I'm going to lose all the weight. I'm going to, you know, you can think of all the amazing dreams we would want to brag about in life, right? And, but he had that. And I think in his youngness and his inexperience, he was just declaring for God's dream. And, but what happened in that declaration was it moved his life. It was the catalyst for God to carry out his plans. And I find it interesting that it seems to be that God's plans are about at times. The vision of God's plan in your life is at times hitting to you what he desires for you. And sometimes it can be so blaringly obvious that it's just, it's just all that you can hear. Like when I mentioned to you about being there with God on Christmas Eve. It was just so evident that this is what God was giving me as a vision of my life. Because God is giving you a vision about your life so that one day, when, as you continue to live into it, you can overcome hate, jealousy, and obstacles that will come. Because you are seeking to fully give God praise by fulfilling what He's giving you. And I can say that my life now, because I've decided to declare the dream all those years ago, no matter how ridiculous it might have sounded to some people, I knew that I had to face the opposition of those who would want to pick it apart, who opposed God, who would, couldn't believe God to be good enough for something for me to serve God in a certain way. And following and declaring the dream challenged me to face my fears, challenged me to deal with brokenness. And if I remained faithful to watch him lead me through it, I knew I was able and was going to be able to declare that I have overcome. Am I perfect? No way. Am I a work in progress? The last day. <laughs> However, what God has elevated to me here is that there is power when we start to declare the dream or the vision of our lives that God has given us. When we start to understand and live into a deeper form of trust, a more assured form of confidence that there is a plan for your life and if you follow it, you can accept that there's going to be opposition. The vision of your life needs to be something you are, it's worth fighting for. And if there's no fight in you, then maybe you're living into the wrong dream for your life. For Joseph, this was just the start of God moving to save his family, the nation, and to keep intact the promise that God had for his grandfather Isaac, that one day a covenant relationship was going to yield a Savior and a Messiah for the world. This was just all how God used a dream. It's pretty amazing. God's vision for your life. Jesus said is it, it quite plainly in the Gospel of John as he prayed in the garden for future believers of his ministry, for you and I, and when he prayed this prayer before he was handed over and arrested and then further he was crucified, he prayed this in John 16, 24. It says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus desires that we live into the destiny he extends to us through his sacrifice. That we understand, like Joseph to Jacob, Christ is God's beloved Son. And both were given a destiny. Both were hated. Both were abandoned. And yet both fulfilled a promise that has given us the opportunity to take on so that we can overcome the opposition in our lives. God's hope and desire for you is that you overcome all that life is throwing at you. And sometimes you don't step into opposition until you are brave enough to follow the dream that God has given you. Joseph had to declare the dream and then he was hated by those who stood in opposition of it. Yet God was there all the while. 
nothing is worth more than standing in the current of opposition and seeking to usher in the good plans of your existence, even if that opposition is first dealing with the rebellion of your own broken heart. Jesus was the son of a carpenter. Then he declared the destiny as the son of God. And he was then in such great opposition, opposition that led him to the death of the cross on our behalf. And you and I are given the same opportunity to declare the vision of our lives. That we have to live into Christ's likeness. So that what one day what is achieved is that in the very presence of Christ in heaven, we're able to see what God desired for us. And you might think there, there is so much to overcome, to live into, into the calling that God has given me in this life. And I see that we are so fortunate because we have a Lord that has declared to us this, take heart for I have overcome the world. There's too much pain. And I don't say this lightheartedly. Christ is there to help you overcome it. There's too much fear, too much loss, too many expectations by those who want to drag us into their commitments. Too many lies unclean. Too many mistakes. Take heart. Christ has overcome it all. And we have the power and the freedom to cast it all upon the one who can bear it all. Let us fight that fight so that we can overcome. I had a conversation with a young adult this week, getting to know them. Very early on in life, God spoke quite plainly to them how they were to live and serve God. Why they had a certain creativity and certain imagination and certain desires and a vision for their life. God was just saying, here, at a very young age, this is what I want for you. And as life went by, they were in a family that didn't know God, and so those voices started to crowd out God's vision for them. And they decided to go to school for a major that they didn't want, but everyone else wanted. And they were just now starting to come into the space after they, after they asked God, please reaffirm what you said to me all those years ago. Was that you? Or was that just my imagination? And God was so faithful that he declared it again into their life. Say, this is how I made you. This is the purpose of your life. This is the dream. And now for the first time, which is why I brought our conversation. They want to not be paralyzed by fear and start to live into that calling. And it's just exciting because they get to, they're going to be faced with conflict, but they get to overcome it with Jesus. And it made me think, what doubt of God's plan, vision, or dream for your life do you need to overcome? Will it disrupt your plans? If you live into it, or the plans of others who are stepping all over your life and they should remain in theirs, get off my pillow. If you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. Perhaps the void you sense in life is because God can't move until you start to allow Him to move into you. You, got, you have to start declaring to others that God has given you a vision for your life. Overcome that fear. Face that opposition with boldness that if it is God who is hinting or screaming into your heart that where he wants to lead me or lead you, then you have to trust that he's going to be there. He's not going to abandon you. And we need to cease to listen to the voice of doubt and turn to the voice of assurance. Flee from the fear of failure and into the opportunity of discovery. From stuffing who you've been called to be to actually embracing the calling of your life. We've all been called to be ministers of the gospel, not just the person standing here. Every single one of you. What an opportunity to overcome obstacles. Overcome it with declaring to your own heart first that you desire to watch God move and use and be ready for God to carry you over those pains, past those fears, and recover perhaps a lost identity that God gave you a long time ago, like the person I talked to, or discover for the first time who God has called you to be. And bring it into a place of proclaiming that vision in your life where you're able to live into the identity as the favored one of God. 
Because that is your identity. As we bear the image of Christ within us, you are the beloved of God. Do not let anyone mislabel you. God has labeled you his beloved. Declare the dream. Get moving into the plan. Don't hold back what God has already planned to lead you through. Let's see how God can overcome any mountain of pain, help you be carried over any gap of fear, so that what in the end we receive is like Jesus prayed, we can reach the completion of our lives and kneeling in his presence, giving him glory. We can be overcomers. Let us live into that life. Let us declare that dream for your life, for your family, for this church, for this community, for this world that needs the vision of God's love for them. Let's declare it. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you have given your church a destiny. That destiny to overcome what perhaps can trip them up, distract them, other voices that can crowd out your voice, God. Lord, you know every heart in this room. You know every moment of pain. You know every piece of joy. God, I pray that everyone in this room can trust a, a full measure more into your love and into the opportunity that if we start to follow you, God, and declare the visions of our lives, that we can overcome anything that we encounter. That we can be, begin to live that extraordinary life of a disciple. God, I pray that we're able to do that together as your body. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for the evidence of Joseph. And thank you as we continue to look into his story, we will see in our lives how we get to overcome. Minister to us, God. Prepare to send us out. That we get into that opportunity of overcoming by your love. We thank you, Jesus, for this time. And as we're dismissed, as we go out into the world, may they know us by the same love. In his precious name we pray. Amen.